What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, period five. So obviously this is the uh, uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. Okay, so let's start off immediately with um, one thing that really led to the Civil War. So the increase in sectionalism uh, that's going to end the Whig Party. So again, just to recap, there's a group, I didn't give you the name or I referenced it, but there's several different groups in the North that began forming. So opposed to a lot of the immigrants coming over in this era was a party that was formed known as the Know Nothings. They got the name originally because it used to be sort of like this, um, what do you call it? Like a secret organization. So if you were asked if you were a part of it, you would say you knew nothing and that's how they like, got their name. Uh, they were opposed to several things, but mostly it was uh, Catholic and Jewish immigrants Um, so like I mentioned before, we had things like the potato famine, a lot of Irish and uh, Southern Germans came over. We had other things like the revolutions of 1848 in uh, <clears throat> Europe that caused a lot of people to come over. We also have um, the Chinese, of course, were coming in high numbers. In fact, these Chinese workers that would come over uh, to mine during the gold rush or build railroads as those uh, railroads stretched across the United States in the West and um, in the East and trying to connect both of them. Uh, those were known as coolies, and a lot of these know-nothings very much opposed the Asian and uh, Catholic immigrants coming over because, you know, they were, they were more what you consider wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and they were opposed to, of course, the Catholic and Jewish and Asian immigrants, so Asians as well. Another reason why we have more Asians coming over, especially in what's later Hawaii, is uh, the Japanese. So in 1853... As you may remember from AP World, um, the Japanese were closed off from the world since 1633 uh, during an era called Sukoku. And so, as the, the fact that they were closed off means they missed out on the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. So, when the United States wanted to open up trade with Japan, uh, and they showed up with gunships, like Commodore Matthew Perry in 53 came by with, with gunboats and basically blackmailed the Japanese to opening up trade to the West. Uh, and then went to China and came back. The Japanese had no choice, of course, but to uh, open up trade in the United States. So we got trade and laborers coming from uh, China, Japan, and a lot of Catholics and Jews coming from Europe. And these know-nothings are very much opposed to that. It's what you call a nativist movement, meaning they believe that uh, not Native Americans, but Native citizens uh, were the ones that were the, should gain preferred treatment. Um, so these know-nothings were actually influential in uh, banning the coolie trade. So those, those um, Chinese workers that were basically indentured servants that would come over and be laborers, uh, they banned the coolie trade, I believe, a link into that in 1862. So they were, they were influential enough to impact politics to some degree, but they weren't influential enough to like form their own party and like, you know, get a lot of congressional seats or, or have a strong presidential candidate. But this does pull away from what was the Whig Party. So the Whig Party is going to be sort of split multiple ways and it's going to cause it to fracture because they're not going to be able to vote in enough uh, congressmen that agree with each other or uh, host a presidential candidate. All right, so those are the know-nothings. And um, we also have a movement uh, known as the Free Soilers. So these, again, are those people I mentioned from period four that oppose slavery because they want to protect wages. And oh, some of these guys were uh, members of the know-nothings, too, and immigrants. Due to uh, wage labor. Because, again, they don't want to compete with black African slaves who work for free. Uh, they want to work as... Uh, basically white laborers that can compete for wages with each other. <clears throat> so, this combined with the abolitionists I mentioned before, 
are going to form what is called the Republican Party. Most notably after 1854. And we know why in 1854 they really, the Whig Party essentially split. Kansas, yeah, the Kansas Nebraska Act. So this is the thing that pretty much killed the Whig Party and caused these, you know, fragmented uh, parties like the Free Soilers, which again, they got their name because um, they want Western territories added to be free states because either they oppose the uh, um, rises in labor or they just don't want blacks going um, west, and then the abolitionists, uh, as well as what was left of the know-nothings. So they're all going to sort of merge together to form this. But the thing that breaks the Whig Party is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of, of 1854. And this was a huge sectional um, issue. So here I'll get a, a small United States going. All right, so a huge <clears throat> sectional issue, because again, we have our states over here. And we've got a roughly even amount. We've got an even amount of uh, north and south. And as they're adding states, we've got California by now, by the way, as a free state. Um, as they're adding this new territory here of Kansas and Nebraska, which is roughly here, um, it is going to be above the 36-30 uh, line, which of course means they have to be free states. But this new act passed by Congress in 1854, mostly the fact that the Whigs could not come together and oppose these Southern Democrats, who are the party of the South Democrats. Um, Whigs are spread throughout. So they could not unify their ideas to really oppose this act because we had Northern Whigs were more free soil slash know nothing slash abolitionists, whereas Southern Whigs were more pro slavery. So since this Whig party was divided, they couldn't really stop Southern Democrats. Uh, from passing acts like this. And uh, acts like this meant that slavery could be introduced to te uh, territories above the 3630 line. So that's going to break the Compromise, or the Missouri Compromise, of um, 1820. You guys remember how they allowed for slavery to enter there, potentially? What the, what the new terms were? Popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty, yeah. So that's going to mean the people that settle that territory can vote to be added as a slave or a free state. <clears throat> so immediately, uh, pro-slave and anti-slave forces are going to rush into the territory, establish their own capitals in uh, Lecompton and Topeka, and they're going to compete violently for uh, authority of the state and uh, forming the constitution <clears throat> and admission. Uh, this actual fighting between whites, <clears throat> pro-slavery whites, and uh, anti-slavery whites is going to be known as uh, Bleeding Kansas. Again, because that is a very violent realization of this sectional conflict. And Whigs could not unify uh, to oppose or support this. So what we're going to have here is a disillusion of the Whig Party uh, in the mid to late 1850s. And these Whigs... The Southern Whigs are just going to very clearly and obviously join the uh, Democrats to form a sort of unified bloc. The Northern Whigs, though, aren't really going to have much of a party to go to. Some of them look at the Know Nothings or the Free Soilers or the Republicans, who are really just abolitionists at this point. And what they're going to have to do to oppose the you know, unified South is form the uh, Republican Party. So again, we have a, a, a spectrum of beliefs, some being kind of anti-slavery, some being super anti-slavery, and of course those, um, um, what, am I, what am I trying to say here? Motivations for being anti-slavery are different, whether you're, you're just trying to protect white wages or you don't like West, uh, blacks in the West, or you actually believe that slavery is immoral. Uh, they're going to form this Republican Party uh, as a block to oppose these sectional Democrats. All right, and this is roughly the issue that does it uh, in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And from this point forward, both sides in the North and in the South are going to believe that both are trying to sabotage the other. 
Northerners think that Southerners are trying to, are engaged in a Southern conspiracy to spread slavery everywhere. And the Southerners believe the Northerners are trying to eliminate slavery everywhere. Whereas what the Northerners generally tend to believe was, we don't want to get rid of it here because you already have it. We just want to limit it to not spreading, right? That's going to be a big, that's going to be Lincoln's platform going forward. Um, obviously during and after the Civil War is going to change with the 13th Amendment and they're going to eliminate it everywhere. But initially it's, these guys want to stop the spread. These guys want to continue spreading, all right, into new territories. But both sides thought they were trying to spread or eliminate it in all states, but they're really just arguing over what to do with these new territories. Does that make sense? All right, so that's going to be a big sectional issue. And of course, now we have our tribes, right? Before the, the Whigs were sort of divided on the issue, it was like, nope, now we have regional and sectional tribes. Like, we oppose you, and they both see each other as, uh, they see themselves as good and righteous, and them as the enemy, and they see themselves as good and righteous, and then them the enemy. So that's what we call, in this case, sectional, because they're in different regions, but we call it tribal, uh, because... Members of your tribe are the good, and members of the other tribe are bad and evil. This is where we start having like actual fights in Congress. There'd already been some earlier, um, like this one Southern senator uh, struck another with a cane. And, like we're actually having verbal and physical fights in Congress at this point, so uh, it's getting a little bit out of hand. All right, so what's well, important to understand, and what they want you to understand, the AP test is, I believe we talk next about. Yes, we talk about um, the pro-slavery arguments. Uh, before I mention that, this is now our third party system. So the Whig party's gone. So we first had Federalists um, and Democratic Republicans. Then we had Democrats and Whigs. And now the Whig party's broken up uh, and with some going to the Democrats in the South and most going to the Republicans in the North. We have our, our third party system of the Republicans in the North, which are generally anti-slavery, and pro-industry, and the South, which is generally uh, pro-agriculture and um, pro-slavery. All right, so we got that third party system. We in the United States tend to have two major parties at once. In Europe, they have a lot of multiple parties or multiple parties that work together uh, temporarily, but we, we kind of have like our two <laughs> tribal blocks, and we've always kind of had that, for better or for worse. All right, so in the South, we have many Democrats that actually try to um, use some pro-slavery arguments. So like I told you guys before, before the cotton gin, most people were leaning the slavery is immoral, we need to get rid of it as good Christians, etc. cetera, uh, argument. But once it became so profitable and important in the South, we have a shift. So we have Northern preachers continuing the slavery is bad, we need to end it, it's immoral, um, sort of sermons and services. In the South, ministers and preachers sort of start backpedaling and saying, oh, well, actually, you know, it's actually a Christian duty to uphold um, um, white America as um, a helpful, uh, what's the word, benevolent sort of ruler for these uncivilized uh, blacks who would otherwise be uh, lost and fighting each other and all these things. So two very different stories being told, both based on Christian beliefs, which is what I mentioned before in period four. So... Uh, pro-slavery arguments from the South, and some, not all, some Northern Democrats, because there are actually some Northern Democrats that are minority, but there's, there's some of them. All right, so pro-slavery arguments. So we've got some based on racial doctrines. These are the more uh, racist in tone. So one argument is that if we allow, okay, they refer to every past civilization ever. What has every, ever, every other past civilization that's been successful in history had? Have they all had slaves? The answer is yes. They've all had slaves. The Greeks had slaves. The Romans had slaves. The Muslim empires have had slaves. The Chinese had slaves. They didn't reference them, but every civilization had had slaves. So they believed, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a fundamental part of the human hierarchy that we formed. If we get rid of this, it's just going to cause too much chaos. So they cited, you know, slavery in the past, and they worried it would sort of destabilize society if they just got rid of it, right? And they made the, they also tried to link it to uh, the sort of patriarchal structure they have, like in the home. 
in that you have the husband's the head of household, has the legal rights, etc. So if we get rid of slavery, then we we might what, what what would be next? Like the patriarchal establishment of you know the household and community. So back then, that was those were two issues that were very important to them, and they uh, argued that getting rid of slavery would cause undue chaos and cause all of the hierarchies that were that had preceded them through human history to sort of dissolve. <clears throat> and the question was like, what would happen if that, if that happened, occurred? Of course, now we know nothing bad, just beneficial to include everybody and allow equal opportunity. But back then they had a lot of people that were skeptical. <clears throat> All right, we also had uh, slavery as a social good. Like I mentioned before, a lot of so Southern preachers uh, believed that it was actually moral to civilize and protect and provide for uh, blacks. So civil, uh, in fact, it's your Christian duty to help others uh, who are not capable of helping themselves. So they tried making a moral argument there, like, oh, well, otherwise their life would be worse. But here we provide them with food and shelter and give them guidance and civilize them. So that was sort of their um, very racist uh, argument for that. Oh, one racial doctrine I forgot to mention. Another one, I should forget this guy's name. Another one by, what was his name? George Fitzhugh. George Fitzhugh. <clears throat> he had a pretty critical argument of slavery. He argued, well, we actually treat slaves better than companies treat workers in the industrial north. He tried arguing that the north had their own slaves. They were just slaves by a different name. He called it wage slavery. And he argued that the conditions and pay and housing for northern industrial workers, and to a degree is right on the conditions. In, in some cases, the, the working conditions, the living conditions of factory workers in the north were worse than some uh, of, the, of the conditions of the slaves. Not saying, of course, that that means it's okay, because at least these guys are doing it by choice, but that was his argument. He was like, whoa, some of your guys' conditions up north in the free areas are actually worse than the uh, protected areas of the south. So that was his argument, saying, well, you already have slavery by a different name in the north, and it's actually worse, uh, which is, of course, untrue. But he was right that at the time the conditions were quite awful, which is why, of course, we're going to have workers' movements and unions later in the uh, 19th century. Any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> and lastly, we had the state's right argument. This was something they tried making in the South in, 1830, in the 1830s when um, they were trying to oppose federal tariffs, like South Carolina, for example, in the 1830s. They tried to nullify the tariff and say, by saying that the United States didn't have, the government didn't have the right to do that, and it was their state's right. But of course, um, that debacle was settled. It was sort of decided that the federal government, in pursuit of trade and commerce, does have the authority to do that. Regardless, the state's rights argument is based on the Tenth Amendment. You guys know what the Tenth Amendment says? It's actually a pretty important one. It's been a point of contention because the Tenth Amendment says every power not expressly given to the federal government is given to which government? The state government, right? Is slavery mentioned in the Constitution? It's not. So Southerners use the uh, argument that, well, since slavery isn't mentioned in the Constitution, it cannot therefore be given to the federal government, and therefore the states have the right to choose each time because it's not in the Constitution. Which is, of course, absurd because that's based on an interpretation that blacks aren't people or citizens and they're property. Um, which would be true then, but we all know that, of course, they're humans, so the federal government does have to protect the rights of all people, which is why that's a total BS argument. But at the time, when they were interpreting blacks as non-citizen property, uh, they were trying to argue that um, since it wasn't mentioned, and they weren't citizens, that it was therefore uh, the state's decision uh, to make it. So, those are the three pro-slavery arguments. We got that? Sweet. Moving on. Okay, those are the arguments. Now let's talk about um, some of the sectional tensions. There's, there's several events, but we I, I picked here like four-ish that sort of helped accelerate and lead to the Civil War. Uh, the first one is going to be, other than this Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, in 1850 we have a compromise, and they're going to reassert the Fugitive Slave Act. 
So one of the strategies was if a slave escaped, they would go north to northern states or to Canada. And the Fugitive Slave Act was a piece of legislation pushed by Southerners that required, it doesn't matter if you're in a slave or a free state, it required people to return slaves to uh, the South to their owner. All right, and that's something that, of course, angered uh, Northerners and uh, pleased Southerners, but sort of drove these uh, tensions uh, further, further down into depths. <clears throat> All right, we also have a court case, um, which is known as the Dred Scott decision. And this was a case where a, an escaped slave, or sorry, a, a slave in a free territory was attempting to sue for his freedom. I can't remember which state it was, but I know it was his master brought him up into the north, and when he was in the north, he was like, okay, this is a free state, and there he tried to sue for his freedom. But the Supreme Court ruling here was that slaves were not, blacks were not citizens, and that they were property, therefore, the government could not take it from them, regardless of what state they were currently residing. All right, and that was another one that angered Northerners and empowered Southerners and drove the division even further. So it's just like you already have two tribes and then you keep throwing in things that make the tribes more angry or happy and split to the point that they're eventually just gonna wanna split on their own and they do. All right, so we've got the Scott decision. Um, we also have one that really angered the South because these both angered the North. This one really angers the South and that's going to be uh, the Harper's Ferry. Um, insurrection. This failed, but the South genuinely believed, or a lot of them believed, that the North was trying to end slavery in the South, which again, most free soldiers weren't. They're were trying to stop it from spreading West. So when a uh, white abolitionist named John Brown, a radical, uh, rallied several other men, mostly uh, blacks and their freed slaves or escaped slaves, they tried to start a rebellion and they, they killed several people. They went to the Harper's Ferry Federal Arms Reserve, uh, got the federal arms there in Virginia, and they started this rebellion, uh, which was stopped, but it was one of those things that just made headlines, like the Nat Turner Rebellion, and really, sh to these Southerners showed that <clears throat> Northerners were determined to end slavery uh, everywhere. So that drove sectional tensions even further in Egypt, and polarizing them even further. What years were the Dred Scott and Harper's Ferry? Uh, 57 for Scott and 59 for Harper's Ferry. All right, we're, we're getting close to the Civil War here. Civil War is 61. <clears throat> so, sort of the last major issue is going to be in 1860, and that's the election of Abraham Lincoln. The reason why Southerners were so angry, angry here is, again, they truly believe the Republican Party was trying to eradicate slavery. When even... You know, Lincoln himself and most free slaves are saying, no, keep your slaves, we're just going to prevent the spread of it. They truly believe that incidents like the um, Harper's Ferry uh, Rebellion and Nat Turner and the efforts of white abolitionists, like a guy like William Lloyd Garrison, uh, he's got a, um, he, he wrote a, an abolitionist periodical named The Liberator. And he formed like the Anti-Slavery Society or something, or the Abolition, American Abolition Society, I don't know, I got the name here, I always forget it. American Anti-Slavery Society, there we go. So the South saw guys like William Lloyd Garrison, who will get were very anti-slavery. Uh, they also had a very, very popular book in the 1850s called um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. I think it was 54 as well. Let me double check that. I'm get that wrong. I don't think I wrote that down. Though. I did not. It was written by Harriet Stowe, though. And that was another anti-slavery uh, book that really drove the opinions of Northerners uh, and Westerners and Southerners, too. In fact, the South tried to respond by, because this was a book that was very critical of slavery and the treatment of African Americans, and I think Uncle Tom was dying anyway. Um, He's treated brutally, and blacks treated brutally throughout this book. The South tried to make like like response reactionary books that painted slavery as a, a moral good and helpful thing uh, for blacks. So it was another thing that sort of drove uh, opinions apart. But blacks, sorry, now, Southerners believed that you know, the acts of uh, guys like 
Frederick Douglass, who I mentioned in period four, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Harriet Stowe here at Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion, the Harper's Ferry Rebellion. They believed that it was a part of a northern conspiracy and effort to just eradicate it. And when they saw Lincoln win the election without winning a single electoral vote in the South, like every single state voted for um, the other guy. It wasn't Buchanan. I forget his name. Lincoln didn't get a single electoral vote in the South, and he still won the election. So uh, the South interpreted that as, well, it's the point of no return. The Republicans have too much federal political power, and they really believed that Lincoln was going to be the one that was going to try to bring the ax down on slavery. Even though he had said otherwise, um, and he clearly did oppose slavery, he, they believed he was there on a mission to end slavery. So that's when we start seeing... In 1861, after this election of 1860, that's where we start seeing the secession of southern states, believing, of course, that slavery is done for them, so they better break away, keep their slaves, and start their own country called the Confederate States of America. So slowly, after 1861 and in 1860, uh, we have South Carolina secedes from the, from the Union. Uh, secedes. And we have the other southern states sort of join as well. The issue became like, what are these border states going to do? Are they going to stay north? Like Maryland, for example, which Washington, D.C. is literally in. Uh, that was a border state. So it was like, well, which way is Maryland going to go? Is it going to stay the Union? Is it going to go with this Confederacy? Regardless, South Carolina secedes. Um, most southern states <clears throat> are going to follow. They're going to form the Confederate States of America. They're going to make their own constitution, which is almost exactly like uh, ours up here, or the, the U.S. Constitution, except they, of course, explicitly pr protect slavery and enhance state rights. Their capitals will be Richmond, Virginia. They start their own government, elect their own president. They do all of these things. Um, and the war is going to be started officially at Fort Sumter when a federal Union uh, base is attacked and, um, not eradicated, but captured by the Confederate States of America. And that's the official beginning of the Civil War. <clears throat> Any questions about the start of the Civil War or how we got there? Okay. Uh, important to know that before and during uh, the Civil War, we also have uh, a black abolitionist. These are white abolitionists here. Right, we had Frederick Douglass, we talked about Nat Turner, uh, the Baptists. Harriet Stowe, uh, White, William Lord, Lloyd Garrison, White. But we also have Harriet Tubman, too, who we've all learned about in grade school. We cited with the Underground Railroad, which again is not literally a railroad, nor is it underground. It's just a sequence of like coordinating houses and, and hotels and buildings where escaped slaves can uh, make it north safely. Uh, so she helped, I think, 70 plus slaves escape in this Underground Railroad. And during the Civil War, she also acted as a scout and a spy for the Union in the North. So she was a very active um, um, abolitionist scout for the Union Army. That's very risky too, though. You ever get caught and they find out who you are, yeah, you don't want the Southerners getting a hold of you. 70 plus slaves or 700? 70 plus. Yeah. I think it was 13 missions and 70 plus slaves, something along those lines. All right, and then again, during the Civil War, she was just as active um, and it was even more dangerous for her then. All right, so we got that. Okay, one thing I want to touch on that's an issue before we talk about the Civil War itself is there was a scary moment for Lincoln and the Union. Because again, like I mentioned, Maryland up here, it's actually got Washington, D.C. in it. Uh, D.C. is its own district, but it's literally in Maryland and, and Virginia as well. So it's, it's right there. And Virginia, by the way, has Richmond, which is the capital of the Confederate States. It's kind of weird. Um, they chose a capital that was like just miles away from Washington, D.C. Anyways, the question was, like, Maryland, like, there's, it's the Chesapeake region. There's a fair amount of slavery and tobacco and things like that going on. So the question became, is Baltimore and Maryland going to go to the south? And then Washington, D.C., the capital of the Union, is, like, in the middle of the, the Confederacy. Um, so it was a point of contention for these border states, especially Maryland. And this became an issue... 
for Lincoln, Lincoln later. Like basically the Supreme Court said what he did was wrong and he just ignored them during the times of war. Like he just sort of grabbed executive power, uh, assuming it was wartime, assigning it was wartime and pretty much ignored the courts. So, four states, Maryland, Baltimore, the, the major cities there, major city there. And um, we had a lot of pro-slavery uh, riots and forces that were present. And to preserve the Union, Lincoln rounded up hundreds of people and imprisoned them without a trial indefinitely uh, to preserve the Union, which is, of course, denying people habeas corpus that right to a trial is very unconstitutional. The court ruled down, you know, struck it down, said it was illegal, uh, unconstitutional, and, and nullified it. But Lincoln just ignored their orders and continued to do it uh, to preserve the Union uh, as it was a time of war. So he used supreme executive power here. Um, and that became a very controversial point, at least constitutionally controversial point going forward, was Lincoln intentionally denying habeas corpus, the right to trial, uh, for members, citizens of the United States at the time. Uh, and again, he, he argued it was for the war and to preserve the Union, but again, the courts said no, and he just continued anyway. So, uh, denied habeas corpus. And then of course it becomes an opinion thing. It's like, well, at that point, do you hold, hold the Constitution or do you act in favor of the war? And is that too much power, power to give to one person? And uh, it, it's, a big, it's a big issue when you actually think about it, but he did it and it was okay and it worked out. I guess unless you were one of the people in prison. <laughs> All right, so we got, as far as the start of, of World War II, of the Civil War. All right, cool. Let's talk about the advantages, some of the processes, then the amendments. And reconstruction, and that'll be it. Although it's gonna take like an hour to talk about that, but those are the topics. All right, oops, the uh, University of the United States. All right, so north and south, got the Confederates. And we have the North, plus California is part of the North. Um, so Mississippi River is a good <clears throat> split between the two sides. And the North's gonna have several advantages and disadvantages. So Northern advantages. They have been industrializing. So they have things like railroads, telephone lines, or sorry, uh, telegraph lines, canals, factories, <clears throat> a higher population, and they're the ones with the Navy. Well, whatever the American Navy is, most of it is um, Northern, Union, right? It's Northern advantages, the Union. Those are a fair amount of advantages right there. That means they have more food, more money, more supplies, more people, more, more better transportation, and a Navy. That's, uh, that's sizable. In fact, for the North, the longer the war goes, the better for them. Um, they're better in the long run because they can last much longer. More people, more supplies, more money, more everything. So what then advantage the South have? What they got? Yep, they do. They've got better generals. General Lee, Stonewall Jackson, etc. cetera. Um, especially Lee. Uh, they're gonna have more experience and better generals, and most of the wars fought in the South, so they have a better knowledge of the terrain. So they kind of have like a home field advantage type thing. Uh, that ends up being bad though, because then the North goes and destroys all their infrastructure, or what, what little there is of it. Uh, but uh, they do sort of have a, a defensive home field uh, advantage. In fact, every time Lee goes on the offensive in the Union territory, he does quite badly. All right, and um, the, the South thoroughly believed that they could cripple the Northern economy by cutting off their cotton. So they believed King Cotton for them was, was the advantage, that if they cut off supply of cotton to the North, that that would mean the Northern industry would fail and they could keep selling cotton to Britain and France um, and that would, would solve their problems. So they believed that cotton was on their side. Would deplete North. And the early parts of the war went well for the South. Um, with the better generals and mobility, they won a lot of early battles in and around DC. There was a lot of times where 
Northern generals hesitated when they could have potentially defeated Robert Lee, e. Lee or, or Southern forces. But they, again, they hesitated. Uh, and, it, and it kind of worked out, because again, they have long-term advantages here. But, I mean, one really bad battle, and you lose your army, and that's it. The South wins, or captures your capital, or whatever. So, it went well for the South initially. Um, and the South, the whole time, is trying their best to become recognized by Britain and France. Because then they can sell them their cotton. The British and French could potentially help them out against the North. Because the North was suffocating the, the South. The longer the war went, the worse it was. The North was uh, doing its best to blockade the South from exporting or importing goods. Um, they were doing their best to capture and control the Mississippi River and cut the South in half. And um, in the meantime, they were trying to use their population advantage by pushing the war on multiple fronts. So, the longer the war goes, the better for the North. I mean, it sucks for everybody because everyone's dying. But the longer it goes, the better for the North, essentially. So, that's what the South's adva advantage is, and that's their strategy is. But despite the success in the first year or two, the North holds on. It, it, it sort of survives that, that early onslaught. And we have two major events here. We have, of course, first the Union victory at, Ante at Antietam. That was a major battle that was technically won by the Union. It was more of a stalemate, but the fact that the South had to retreat was sort of an overall tactical victory in 1862. And this really hurt the Confederacy's chances of being recognized by um, the British and the French. So at that point, the British and the French are like, ah, oh, it doesn't look like you have a chance of winning. We're not going to support you if you don't have a chance of actually succeeding in, in hurting the Union. Um, and <clears throat> on top of that, Lincoln, with this momentum, uses a chance to um, administer or issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Which, contrary to popular belief, did not actually free slaves, but he, as the commander-in-chief, had the authority to legally confiscate the property of enemy states. And what did the Southerners consider property? Slaves. Slaves, right. So, <clears throat> what this Emancipation Proclamation did was say, Confederate territories, the Union could confiscate the slaves and grant them citizenship, put them into the army, which many of them did, um, as well as any free blacks in the Union. And uh, that's going to also bolster the moral, uh, make the war more of a moral issue rather than a, an issue of preserving the Union or fighting for states' rights. It sort of redefines war. And the British were very anti-slavery at this point. They had banned the slave trade worldwide in 1833, meaning it doesn't matter if you think it's legal or not, the British are going to take your slaves if they're being shipped. Uh, and, and France had also abolished slavery. Um, during the French Revolution, although Napoleon kind of brought it back in the Caribbean, they had abolished it. So Britain and France were very anti-slavery. So the fact that the, the North became officially anti-slavery and the, the South remained pro-slavery, the uh, Europeans are going to, of course, drop any efforts to support the South at this point. So the loss at Antietam and the making the war more of a moral issue following the momentum there really kill the South's chances of getting any foreign support. And also, too, at this point, um, the, the, I can't remember which port it was, there was a major port that the South was getting a lot of supplies from, and uh, the, the Union had broken through and, and captured that port. So the Union had, like, really locked in on the blockade, and shortly after this, the Union is also going to win at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. I believe there's both in 1863, don't quote me, but shortly after, Gettysburg and Vicksburg. So, Lee's defeated in the north, he has to retreat back to the south, it's a major defeat for the south, as well as a large loss of soldiers. And, when the Union won at Vicksburg, which they had been sieging for a while, uh, and they took that, that was the last major uh, fort or protection for the Mississippi River. So now, the Union had them blockaded, had them cut in half, do their victory at Vicksburg with the Mississippi, and Lee had been defeated in the north and had to retreat back to Virginia. So it looked very, very good for the Union at this point. It's still going to take them two more years to actually end it. Um, but realistically, at this point, momentum shifted heavily in the favor of the Union. 
Also, too, this is where Lincoln gives his Gettysburg Address, or shortly after it. And he stresses the importance of the war, <clears throat> importance of the war as sort of a, a, a moral war, again, where they're fighting for liberty and equal opportunity and preserving the Union. And that sort of changes the message. In fact, this, I think, was the first or one of the first speeches where they referred to the United States as the United States, not these United States, meaning it had always been referred to as these United States before, as in like a bunch of independent states that just happened to work together. Whereas he genuinely saw it and referred to it as the United States, meaning like one entity, like the states don't have their own identity. We are one nation that needs to be preserved. So again, here in his Kettysburg Address, he really hit on uh, unity, preserving the union, uh, equality and liberty, which are very much uh, fundamentals of the U.S. Constitution. <clears throat> so it's looking bad for the South. Looking really bad for the South. Um, also, we have a couple things going on. We have a massive Union Army uh, under the command of um, Sherman. How's his first name? Whatever, his last name is Sherman. General Sherman. He has a massive army of like 100,000 soldiers-ish, and so does uh, Grant. He uses this Grant over here in, the, uh, in and around Washington, D.C. So I've got Sherman and Grant, and they both have large, large armies of around 100,000, and there's just no southern army that can oppose that. You have Lee running around with like 60,000, uh, fighting Grant, you know, mostly at a stalemate. Uh, and that allows Sherman to literally march right through all of the southern territory and go through and capture and destroy, essentially, the major city of Atlanta. This is called Sherman's March. <clears throat> Sherman's March to the sea. And he literally marched to Atlanta, sieged it, captured it, and then continued up the north uh, in an effort to surround and destroy uh, Lee's North Virginia, or Army of the North Virginia. So Sherman's March destroyed, captured Atlanta. And this is, the point, this is what really breaks the South back. So they're cut in half, they're blockaded, and Sherman just walks through and destroys much of their major infrastructure uh, in the city of Atlanta, which of course hasn't really been touched much throughout the war and is producing a lot of goods. So the Southern economy is just wrecked. So here's the economy. The Southern economy, that is just down in the tubes. So the Union Army has been, has been and was marching through. So they uh, uh, cut off ports, Destroyed roads and railroads. And despite the fact that the, uh, the South could make a lot of agriculture, like cultivate it, grow it, and had food, they couldn't move it because the limited railroads they had were essentially destroyed by the, by the Union armies. So they destroyed the railroads. Um, the Union of course, did confiscate and, and kill livestock and, and slaves and also... Um, Crops, so um, livestock, crops, slaves, either taken or destroyed or killed. And the South pretty much had nothing. Almost all the men were gone. Um, the Confederate government had to literally go around and impress, like impress them, like take, not like, oh, look how good we are. They had to like literally impress food and supplies from Southern families, so it was really, really bleak. Uh, the Confederate government impressed food supplies. And the South's just pretty much out of everything. Like, there's literally Union armies marching around in the heart of the South. There's nothing the South can do about it. So, uh, with all this going on, uh, and their economic depravity, and the slaves being taken, and then re repatriatized in the North as soldiers, I think at this point, 10% of the Union army was uh, black Americans, black Africans, and um, half of those were confiscated slaves. So you had 5% of the Union Army was former Southern slaves, and 5%, of course, were free blacks in the North. Uh, those guys were paid. Uh, initially, they weren't paid equally, but by 1864, the uh, uh, Army was now paying white and black soldiers the same. I know they started out segregated, uh, and they remained segregated, but, but at first, the whites sort of doubted the ability of, of black soldiers, but after they saw how they performed in battle, you know, just as well as the Union white soldiers, <clears throat> these black units 
sort of gained a lot of respect from uh, the fellow uh, white soldiers. They were always run by a white officer, but they did, they did keep them segregated in their own uh, black uh, units. Uh, but they did well, they earned equal pay. And after the war, they're gonna be granted uh, and guaranteed citizenship, especially for their service and contributions to maintaining the Union. So that's a topic we'll talk, actually we just talked about it, so just know that. 10% of the UN, Union Army is gonna be black, 5% uh, of that, or half of those 10% are former slaves. Start out not paid equally, they end up becoming paid equally, and they're gonna get uh, citizenship and voting rights afterwards uh, due to their service. You had a question? Um, it says cut off ports, destroyed roads and railroads, is that what it says? Yep, basically destroyed infrastructure. And then they went around taking, killing, or stealing livestock, crops, and slaves, and the South was just done at that point. <clears throat> they were printing money, trying to print money, but people, some people weren't valuing or recognizing the, the Confederate currency because they were a failing government who was literally taking uh, supplies from the, own, the families of the Confederacy, so it was uh, not a good situation. So before Sherman could get there to surround Lee, um, uh, Grant cut him off in the South and forced Lee to surrender at Appomattox. And as soon as that was done, that was it for the South. Any random hope they had of getting some like last minute major victory ended uh, when Lee surrendered. So the, the war is pretty much going to end after that. So 1865, Appomattox. Lee surrenders. 1865, and that's pretty much the end of the war as far as it goes. Um, one thing I will talk about before we talk about Reconstruction is obviously the Southern economy got just annihilated, but the Northern economy actually grew. So several things are gonna happen here <clears throat> in the North. I'll make sure I get them all, first of all. Yes, so of course they're gonna double down. They're not really interfered with. The South doesn't really get up into the North much. So they're able to expand their industry as well as the railroads, canals, all those things. Uh, so you actually have economic growth uh, in, the, um, in the North. They print more currency to pay for the war. Uh, they have a, a massive influx of immigrants, and many of those immigrants are uh, put into the uh, Union Army. So we have a large military. Um, they're getting money. They're spending that money. So you actually have a lot of debt, obviously, from the war, but you also have economic growth in the North. Um, uh, factories, immigrants to factories are going to increase substantially. Uh, you also have the beginnings of the intercontinental um, or the transcontinental railroad with the Pacific Railroad Acts of 1862, as well as the Homestead Acts of 1862. And this is going to provide a lot of economic growth and prosperity because basically what happened is this Pacific Railroad Acts. Uh, this is an agreement that they want to connect the East and the West. So what they did was the federal, <clears throat> federal government gave these massive land grants and loans to these private railroad companies. Uh, like, we're talking millions of acres, making railroad companies by far the largest landowners in um, the United States and possibly the world. They gave these huge land grants uh, across the United States in hopes of them, of course, uh, connecting the United States via transcontinental railroads. Um, so huge economic growth there, because that means these railroad companies not only can build the rail lines, and of course profit from that, people using that to transport and move quickly, uh, but they also have, they now, now they have a bunch of real estate they can sell to speculators, so that's gonna increase the amount of loans, people moving westward. Um, you also have growth because we need more labor to build these railroads, so immigrants coming in, uh, people from the east or the west, working together, being paid to connect these two regions. So you actually have economic and transportation growth in the North during the uh, Civil War. And lastly, the Homestead Acts, that was the idea that the federal government would grant you land uh, anywhere in the, in, the, in the territories west of the Mississippi as long as you could cultivate and sell the land for five years or more. So that really convinced a lot of families to move out west, cultivate, um, make, you know, cash crops. And a lot of these people, by the way, settled by the railroads, obviously, because they have supplies and connection with civilization and people. Um, so you have a lot of spotted settlements. It's actually kind of cool if you notice. If you've got a population map of the U.S., 
you'll see basically the population is like in like three or four major lines and settled around major cities that were all, of course, started in and around the uh, railroads. Um, so yes, the Homestead Acts drove people west, caused them to become more prosperous. Um, these railroads provided a bunch of economic opportunity for laborers, for real estate, uh, for homesteaders. And uh, you actually have the growth of transportation uh, and factories in the north, despite the Civil War. So south, wrecked, north, grew economically and population-wise too. All right, we got that? Okay. Now the question becomes, what do we do with the rebel states? So there's a few things that Lincoln, um, and of course after he's assassinated, other Republicans uh, get accomplished before these states are readmitted. So firstly, Lincoln and his uh, Secretary of State, <coughs> William Seward, uh, get the 13th Amendment uh, proposed by two-thirds of Congress and then ratified by two-thirds of the state. And the 13th Amendment, of course, universally bans uh, slavery, abolishes slavery. Uh, it wasn't easy to do because a lot of Northern Democrats or even some Republicans were hesitant to free all slaves everywhere because the question was, what do we do with you know, several million slaves that are now free? Do we accept them as citizens? Do we give them jobs? Do we give them the right to vote? Like, they weren't sure on what to do. Of course, the answer to those things is yes, but they weren't sure on how to approach that. So it wasn't as easy as just pass it. Um, Lincoln and Seward had to essentially bribe a lot of uh, Northern Democrats and Republicans with um, promises of federal jobs, which is, you know, maybe a little unethical, but I think the overall goal sort of means to an end here was, was ethical. Nonetheless, we got the 13th Amendment uh, to be approved, proposed, and uh, passed by the Senate and the House of Representatives, and then, of course, ratified by three quarters of the states. And so the 13th Amendment gets passed, hooray. And um, the people that really wanted this passed were a group of Republicans referred to as the Radical Republicans. What made them radical at the time? They wanted to punish the South. Okay, that's true. But I'm talking about in reference to slavery. You're right. They did want to punish the South. And they wanted to abolish slavery. Yeah, on moral grounds. And they wanted to, most of them wanted to give grant like full equality uh, to blacks, which a lot of Republicans, like the Free Soilers and the Know Nothings, and uh, a lot of former Whigs were definitely not ready for by the time. So radical Republicans want abolition. Uh, black equality, obviously, rightfully so, but at the time, people not ready for that. And then, of course, later they want to punish the South, too. So one of the leaders of the radical Republicans was a senator named, uh, or a House uh, congressman named Thaddeus Stevens, and others, and they were influential in pushing these next two amendments. So the 13th Amendment, as well as the 14th and 15th Amendment, were all known as the uh, Reconstruction Amendment. Reconstruction, of course, referring to the period of uh, reincorporating and rebuilding the Confederate States. And the Reconstruction era is generally seen as, roughly speaking, 1866 to 77. Well, 65 to 77, depends on, on who you ask. But it's a roughly decade, a little longer than a decade uh, period in U.S. history. <clears throat> so, Fourth Amendment. Uh, proposed by the radical Republicans and, of course, passed through Congress uh, in the states, right by the states, is going to provide uh, equal protection to the law. Meaning, laws could not favor or persecute citizens based on things like race. So it doesn't matter what your race, religion is, etc. Laws apply to you just the same. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or whatever. That's a very important one. In fact, that's going to be the most cited amendment during the Civil Rights in the 1960s, saying, hey, look at these laws. These are not equally protecting all people. They're picking you know, skin colors and, and other attributes. What we need to have is laws that are equally applied to everybody, because duh, we have the 14th Amendment. <clears throat> and so that's gonna be a big motivator for the Civil Rights Movement going forward in the 1960s. Also the 15th Amendment, which roughly speaking, provides uh, the vo voting rights for blacks. But not women. 
I believe they specifically use the word men or males in the 15th Amendment. <clears throat> all right, so these three amendments, all of course, do protect blacks. They're mostly pushed by radical Republicans and other Republicans, and uh, they are known as the Reconstruction Amendments. And these are all going to be influential, especially the 14th, in um, establishing the legality of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s when they start you know, desegregating schools and uh, providing uh, voting and protection acts uh, to all groups like they, like they should have, according to the amendments. <clears throat> Okay, what do I want to talk about next? The amendments. Oh yeah, women. So women uh, in relation to this uh, abolitionist movement. Um, this whole movement for egalitarianism, or like, you know, obviously expanding rights to all people as it should have been, according to the Constitution. Uh, feminism is going to get, first white feminism is going to get a uh, boost here. So feminist attendance and attention is going to increase here. Uh, especially with these radical Republicans that are moving for the protection and enfranchisement of, uh, of black Americans. So feminism is going to be on the rise here. You're going to see a lot of abolitionists and egalitarians ally themselves with feminists because they're both advocating the same thing. Complete protection, protection and equality to all people. All right, so you have like Frederick Douglass. Um, you have, of course, major uh, feminist leaders like Susan B. Anthony. They're all going to initially work together. However, these amendments, while they bring more feminists uh, and work together with a lot of male, uh, white, and black male abolitionists, they're also going to be split over this issue, especially this part here about uh, wording it as men and not including women in there. So here's the two arguments. So like, for example, Frederick Douglass, this is, this is where we're going to see a sort of split in the feminist movement. So guys like Frederick Douglass at, argued that many were not ready for, while well, he agreed with it, he, he also bl believed pragmatically that most people were not ready in Congress for women to have equal protection and rights um, and voting rights. <clears throat> so he's like, don't jeopardize black enfranchisement. Essentially, get black enfranchisement consolidated, and that will open the way for women to eventually earn the same thing. And he also argued that white women already had more rights and protections than blacks anyway. But on the uh, Susan B. Anthony side, they argued that no, we should move for a complete equality uh, regardless of what you think the environment or climate is like. Um, so you have, of course, the Frederick Douglass wing a bit more on the pragmatic side and the Susan B. Anthony wing a little bit more on the ideological side, I guess you could say. Uh, so it does cause a sort of fracture in the feminist movement. So we have... I don't have the year, I think I've written down, is it 80, 67, or 69 maybe? Double checking, I don't remember. 69, okay. So in 69, we have two associations for form. So in 1869, we have kind of a split of this feminist movement, which again, sort of rose in this egalitarian sort of climate, but then split on the issue of including women specifically. Some saying we should include women, some saying that jeopardizes black rights and enfranchise, but we should wait, essentially. So. Uh, one fragmentation was, of course, the um, National Women's Suffrage Movement, or uh, Association. And this is the side that pushed for complete equality. And they, they by the way, rejected male support. So they rejected the Frederick Douglass wing and those that said that men and women should work together and they should sort of move for black enfranchisement here and then focus on women. They rejected that and said, all or nothing, right? Not as pragmatic, but it's, it's more ideologically driven than anything. On the more pragmatic side, we had the uh, <clears throat> American Women's Suffrage Association. And this maintained the alliance with not only workers later, but also uh, white and black male uh, egalitarians and abolitionists. So again, this is the more pragmatic side, uh, and this is the more ideological side. Uh, obviously this does work eventually, but um, it works more along the order or timeline that these guys had in mind over here as opposed to these guys. All right, so, is that what I want to say about that? Oh, I guess I could say this. 
Uh, the National Women's Association is based in New York, and the American um, uh, Women's Suffrage Association is going to be based in Boston. So that is kind of the split of feminism. So it grows, but it also splits. So a pro and a con there. All right, we got that? Sweet. All right. So, yeah, let's do Reconstruction. We can do it pretty quick, I think. All right, Reconstruction. So, there was, of course, the Radical Republicans that wanted more so to punish the South. And then we have the more moderate Republicans that wanted to sort of receive them back more... Uh, on the lines of forgiveness, along the lines of forgiveness. So they are gonna require uh, the state constitutions for rebel states to accept and ratify these amendments, but not initially. Initially, the uh, President Andrew Johnson, who of course took over when Lincoln was assassinated, uh, he was more pro-forgiveness, I guess you would say. He wanted to accept them back as like a, kind of like the prodigal son, like that old Bible, fairy tale, fairy tale, or par parable, where like the son goes off, blows all his money, comes back, and the dad takes him back anyway, even though he, he just totally renounced his family, right? Johnson was more along those lines. Congress, though, was controlled almost exclusively by Republicans and a lot of radical Republicans. Uh, so Congress was very anti-forgiveness. They're much more about punishing the South, punish South. And while Johnson had a lot of influence in the first year after the uh, Civil War, uh, Congress is going to well, try to impeach him just because they don't like him. Um, but also they're gonna uh, take, they're going to issue several pieces of legislation that are very punishment oriented towards the South, which Johnson of course is gonna veto because he opposes that, but the South, or sorry, the Congress is gonna have enough support to override those vetoes with the two thirds votes. So one of those examples is are the Reconstruction Acts Of 1867 and these are not by any means forgive and forget acts these are definitely punishment oriented acts so these sought to punish the South and they sought to remove a lot of those old uh, Democrats who had basically rebelled in the first place so Johnson of course didn't want to punish them a whole lot he wanted to accept them back and then assimilate them uh, and Congress led mostly by radical Republicans uh, or Republicans in general wanted to punish them. So, Reconstruction Acts. So they're gonna require the ratification of these um, <clears throat> Reconstruction Amendments. So first of all, they're gonna require state constitutions of rebel states to adopt some of those uh, Reconstruction Amendments. Because they wanted to make sure blacks in the South had equal protection of the law and had the right to vote, right? So obviously, there's no more slavery already, but they wanted them to have that equal protection of the law over there. Because the South's going to operate pretty quickly to try to maintain as close to slave conditions as possible in the South. All right, they're also going to uh, start the uh, military districts over there. In the, so you're going to have the Union forces, literally like armies, that are essentially run by a Union general, a Republican general, and they're gonna divide into five military districts. And those militaries are there to ensure that the states, of course, follow along with the Union's uh, Reconstruction Acts. They're gonna also try to, um, what's the word, intimidate or scare off any old Southern Democrats from returning to power. And uh, it's gonna be an expensive process, right? Keeping thousands of soldiers down there in the South and giving them wages and paying for their uh, stay and, and feeding them, and, and equipment, it's gonna be very pricey. So it's not gonna be able to last very long, but that's initially how it goes. So a very punishment-oriented approach initially. All right, so a lot of these Northern Republicans that come down to act as governors or local officials, or even uh, bring their businesses down to try to uh, profit from the loss of the South by um, starting like, you know, construction companies or railroad companies or factories or their own farms or whatever. Those guys are known as carpetbaggers. And they got the name from like that old, like, I don't know if you guys watched Looney Tunes, like they'd have the guy walking around on the railroad with like a stick and like a sack on the back. 
they call them carpet baggers because they would put their like belongings in this like carpet bag and walk in and you know start their business or whatever. So <clears throat> many Northern Republicans moved south, of course, to take positions of power as a governor or a state official, and also uh, to benefit from their business by literally reconstructing the South or purchasing land cheaply. So Northern Republicans uh, went south, they're known as carpetbaggers. And how do you think they are seen or received by people who were in the South already? Do you think they're welcomed? No, they're gonna be, of course, despised and loathed as foreigners trying to take advantage of their situation. All right, um, you're also gonna have a group referred to uh, these are Southerners, uh, Southern cooperators. So those who are like, well, I don't believe in these things, but they're not going to leave. So I may as well benefit from the situation. So these are Southern Democrats that either became Republican or voted with or acted Republican uh, to try to benefit. These were referred to as Scalawags. Again, those are Southern Democrats that worked with Northern Republicans because they realized that, you know, they're not gonna have another civil war. They lost, they're trying to lose as little as possible or benefit as much as possible. And again, those people as well are not going to be looked, are not gonna be greeted friendly by, by Southerners. So we got Northerners coming out, carpetbaggers, and Southerners working with them. Uh, and again, they're not gonna be uh, viewed very favorably. Okay, so <clears throat> what's gonna cause this sort of occupation and protection to start of wane and disappear is, uh, well, just time, really. So first of all, uh, we have Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, I'm hungry. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was like a janitor rolling. <laughs> no, yeah, it sounded like one of those things. Uh, Grant's going to uh, take over as president, and he's way more lenient. And he's also more, uh, He's not a states' rights guy, but he doesn't like as much federal control as Congress is trying to use. Uh, so he's less centralized, I guess you could say. So he starts withdrawing the military because it's expensive. As well as the fact that a lot of these radical Republicans that are controlling Congress, they either literally die just of old age, um, or they just become less enthusiastic about egalitarian. So you have the uh, uh, death, slash loss of enthusiasm by Northern Republicans. So as a result, by the 1870s, the late 1870s, almost all Northern Republicans that were carpetbaggers had gone back to the North or just assimilated into the South, and most of the Southern scalawags had um, ceased to keep acting in the interests of the Republicans because they believed, all right, well, the military's gone, most of these carpetbaggers are gone, or they're just Democrats now. Uh, so it's more beneficial for us to just keep with the old Southern traditions. So by the 1870s, especially the late 1870s, Reconstruction is largely going to end because uh, Grant, of course, pulls the military out because it's too expensive. And then um, that egalitarian enthusiasm just kind of dies out because either radical, radical Republicans have died off or they've just straight lost their enthusiasm for it. Like you, can't keep, you can't remain enthusiastic about things for 10 years, uh, so it does just kind of die out. What does it say before? Um, less centralized? Um, lenient. Mm -hmm. He's a little more lenient. Right, obviously, he was a Union general, so he's not like, yeah, just free the South, whatever. But um, he's more lenient than radical Republican. He's not a radical Republican. He's more moderate. Mm -hmm. So moderates tend to not be as, well, radical, because they're not radicals. All right, so some, uh, the last thing we'll talk about is how the um, South sort of treated blacks um, during and after Reconstruction. So one of the first things they do is they try to maintain the closest possible conditions to slavery as possible. Um, so some things they began were sharecropping and tenant farming. So they're basically acting as serfs. If you guys remember serfs and peasants from um, uh, AP Euro or AP World, it's where you're working, you're using your labor to make things or produce things like you know, grow agriculture, um, and you give a certain percentage to the actual owner, right? So many of these plantation owners had slaves, 
So they allowed the slaves to work there as sharecroppers. So they would work for the plantation. Most of those, most of that agriculture would go to the plantation owners and then the um, sharecroppers would get to keep some on their own and use it or sell it or whatever. And this usually worked out okay. It wasn't like slavery, but it wasn't enough money for them to really get out of that situation. So tenant farmers, which is very much the same thing, uh, and sharecroppers uh, were sort of stuck in that scenario. So again, they weren't, they could leave, but many of them were not able to, at least easily. But the option was there, at least. Uh, you also had something called the Black Codes and Convict Labor. This is a really a bad mark on American history. <clears throat> so, it's a little complicated, but the Black Codes, this is from Black, not Black Codes. The Black Codes, this actually negatively impacted poor whites as well. It basically made it much easier to arrest people in the South for these really, really um, innocuous or harmless crimes. So like loitering, I'm making this up, but like, say, say you're like loitering, right? You're just hanging out, you're not supposed to be there. They made laws that made those a much more punishable or severe um, crime. So they would basically go around and find blacks and poor whites that were violating these minor crimes and arresting them and throwing them into the private prison system. And those private prisons, which of course are paid by the state to hold these prisoners, would then uh, contract these convicts out as super cheap, nearly slave rate labor. Um, so that, that actually allowed people to use super cheap labor that was almost slave level by rounding up prisoners, imprisoning them, and then using them as cheap labor for like their stone quarries or mines or plantations or whatever, or railroad track bullets. That's why you see like a lot of those old videos where like they're in prison and they're all, they got like a chain on each foot and they walk out and they're all hammering, you know, a, a railroad tire or a rock quarry, that's convict labor. So black codes were essentially laws that made it really easy to arrest people, especially poor people, poor whites, blacks, put them in the prison system, and then have them work for very, very cheap, uh, contracted out by these um, uh, private prisons. So that was something that was quite negative and really kept blacks and poor whites down in the South. Um, but also, there was individual acts of discrimination uh, and violence. You had groups like the KKK form, the Ku Klux Klan, and others that would deliberately attack and bully uh, blacks, either pro, either pro abolitionist, sorry, either abolitionist whites or free blacks. They would destroy their homes, uh, persecute, lynch hang, hurt them, uh, flog them, steal from them, etc. Uh, they moved anonymously. Obviously, eventually got the whole hooded, you know, movement and all that. And a lot of times they weren't really pursued or punished by Southern law enforcement because either Southern law enforcement was a part of it or they just didn't really care what was happening to the black population. So you had a lot of fear and discrimination from the KKK. The black codes made it hard for blacks and poor whites to operate there without being arrested. And that's going to cause what we know now is like the Great Migration later, which is many, many, many blacks moving to the north to work in um, northern factories. It's a bit later, but it does help lead to that. So just know there's a lot of legal, economic, and uh, private, it's not all discrimination necessarily, but these are all conditions that lead to either discrimination directly or conditions that were as close to slavery as possible. There is some hope though, because there was at least one, um, one large organization that was there to help these newly freed blacks by pro pro providing them with clothing or food or work or shelter. And it was the Freedman's Bureau. And that worked very well, or at least quite well, during the Reconstruction era. But once the military had moved out and the carpetbaggers had gone or assimilated and the Scalawags weren't working with them, you know, the KKK picked up, the Black Codes are in action. The Freedman's Bureau is going to be, lose a lot of influence because they just, it's a hostile environment for them to operate. So while they did provide a lot of aid to uh, newly freed slaves, it's going to be a lot harder for them after 1867, when the northern militaries are gone, uh, to continue to operate and help blacks in the south. Um, let's also not forget, this is more of a period uh, six issue, but very quickly here, we're going to have Jim Crow laws, which of course legally segregate um, public facilities. Right, so that's going to be more of a period six thing. 
uh, but we do see the beginnings of that here. Like for example, they start issuing literacy tests and poll taxes um, so that blacks can't vote in the South. It's like, well, you can vote, you just gotta pass this literacy test. And of course, former slaves were not educated, they can't read or write, they can't pass those literacy tests, or they're so poor that they can't afford to pay the poll tax and vote. So those are all ways that blacks in the South were um, remained persecuted and discriminated against. Any questions? All right, that is period five. We done, period four.